life with God in the paradise of heaven. Yours in Jesus Christ. Amen. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? Memorial stones going off in every direction. Some large and fancy, some barely there. Large stones and small stones tucked in close together. Underneath them, rich and poor tucked in close together. Perhaps closer together there than anywhere above the ground. Names of people you know and names of strangers. Words of love by so many of those names. Words like love and beloved and dear. Names and numbers. Names and year numbers. Year for when people were born. The year of when people died. Some lived to be 70, 80. Uh, even a hundred and more. And some just as old as my age, or teenage, or even younger. Some stones, you see, just have one number, one year. The year of birth and also the year of death. And you also see some other stones with Name and a number, a number for when they were born. And then another number, two, zero, blank. A place left. Because, well, why? They know their time is coming, right? We know that our time is coming, don't we? My time is coming. Your time is coming. And if the best that we could live for were a few years here, and then a stone chiseled in the word dear, that wouldn't be much to live for, would it? If the best that we could hope for here were ashes to ashes and dust to dust, that wouldn't be much to hope for either, would it? But on some of those stones... You see a cross. And you might wonder, why? Was it just a cliche? Or is that cross there for some other reason, some better reason? You look around and you see another stone. And in that stone, you see, chiseled in the words of Job, I know that my Redeemer lives. On another stone you see, Jesus' words, I am the resurrection and the life. And as you look around and see some of those crosses and those words, it seems, it seems that there are some people who believe that there's more to life than death. More to life than ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And it seems that there are some people who believe that there's more to life than eat, drink, and be merry and working for the weekend. That there's more to life than following or chasing around some ball. And it seems that there are some people who are looking forward to something more and something better than a concrete box in the ground an acrylic jar up on the shelf, or a scattering in the wind. We get to be those people. We get to be those people believing that there is something more and better than what we can see around us. We get to be those people living for something more. Why? Not because we might take care of ourselves with vitamins and exercise and trying to eat right. And not because we might be more beloved or more loving than somebody next to us. And not because we live a good life or we work hard to get the good life. No. No matter 
how good we might be, be, no matter how hard we might work at living or having the good life, it doesn't take a CAT scan or a PET scan to tell me that I will die. And no matter how good and loving I try to be, a walk through most any cemetery will tell me that there's an awful lot of good and loving people who are dead. Buried next to and among people who weren't at all good and loving. And what do we see even here in Libertyville? Even here in Libertyville with our nice houses and our nice restaurants and great hospital. Even here in Libertyville, we have a cemetery. And not just one. And so why do we get to hope for something more and something better than what we see in the cemetery? Why do we get to hope for something more, something better than what we can see and pay for around here in town? Why? Because we have Jesus. Whether we're rich or poor, young or old, we, we have Jesus. We have the Jesus who raised the daughter of Jairus to life. We have the Jesus who raised Lazarus to life. We have the Jesus who even raised himself from dead to living, from death to life. But all those amazing miracles that had people awed, all those amazing miracles of raising the dead to life, all those would mean precious little. If it weren't for this, not only does Jesus have what it takes to beat the biology of death, Jesus has done what needs to be done to take the sting, the curse out of death. You see, we don't die because of old age. We don't die because of old age or sickness or cancer or some sort of accident where we run into something or somebody runs into us. No, we die because the wages of sin is death. We don't die because of biology. We die because of sin. Death is God's judgment on a world that would rather listen to itself than listen to God. Death is God's judgment on a world that would rather do its own thing than do the things of God. Death is God's judgment on a world that would rather hold on to the here and now than hold on to Jesus. Thank God. Thank God that Jesus didn't hold on to himself. But Jesus let go of himself to carry your guilt and mine, the guilt of the world. Jesus let go of himself to live and die for us. He let go of himself to do what God gave him to do, to live and die for us, to bring us together with God. And because Jesus did what God gave him to do, Jesus was able to shout out, It is finished. God's judgment is finished. God's or else, you better get it right or else, is finished. Your guilt, my guilt, the guilt of the world with Jesus is finished. Finished with guilt and finished with death. Jesus was able, he was free to let his body die. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then finished with guilt and finished with death, Jesus was free to leave death behind and to take his life back again. And that is exactly what he did on Easter Sunday morning. Just as he promised, he took back his life, raised himself from death to life, not just in spirit, like he was up in heaven, 
but he raised himself back to life in body and in spirit. And now alive in body and in spirit. Jesus lives to keep his promise to you. Because I live, you also will live. And alive in body and in spirit, he lives to keep his promise to you. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now, hearing that promise of heaven, we might wonder, what will heaven be like? Hearing that promise of life, we might wonder, what will I be like? Well, when we die with Jesus, and there's two key words there. When I die with Jesus. When I die with Jesus, my body and soul separate, and my soul goes to be with God in heaven. My soul alive with God in heaven, I am safe and secure forever. My soul alive with God in heaven, I'm celebrating with the saints and angels. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? safe and secure and celebrating forever. But it gets even better. Not because being safe and secure and alive and celebrating forever as a soul with God is a bad thing, but God is something even better for us. On the last day, on Judgment Day, when Jesus returns to this world, he will raise up all the dead. All the dead. Now, those who in their life in this world died without Jesus, lived without Jesus, couldn't be bothered with Jesus. Those who had other and better things to do than think Jesus. Well, their souls will be reunited with their bodies body and soul in hell forever. They didn't have time for Jesus here. They won't have time for Jesus in eternity either. But those who live and die with Jesus, who believe in Jesus, who long for Jesus, our bodies will be raised and reunited with our souls to live forever with our God in heaven. Now that might bring up the question, what will our resurrected bodies be like? So your body in heaven will be your body. Not just a replacement body given to you to replace the old body that you have now. No, in heaven you will have your body, the same body you have now, except, except it won't be the same. My body as it is now is a dying body, a weak body, a body that has been shamed by sin and evil, a body that I have shamed with sin and evil. If, if God were to just swap out this old wreck of a body for a new and improved body, I think I'd be mighty happy. But God doesn't see you and your body as garbage to be thrown out, to be thrown away and done with. No, God sees your body as the home of your soul. He sees your body as the home of his spirit. He sees your body. He sees you and your body. He sees you and he loves you. And so, on that last day, God isn't done with your body. Throw it away and leave it behind. No, on that last day, God will raise our bodies, take our bodies, and change them. Instead of a dying body, you will have a living, undying, immortal body. Instead of a body shamed by the sin and evil of this world, you will have a body that shares in the glory of God. 
No more allergies or arthritis. No more colds or cancer. No more pain or sickness. And as great as that sounds, but it does sound great, doesn't it? But as great as that sounds, I wonder if this doesn't sound even better. In that new life, with our changed bodies, no more, no more nasty thoughts zipping in and around the brain. No more ugly memories etched into our memory and brains. No more gutter moments. No more triggers to fear. No more triggers to sin. No more addictions. No more of those mental ruts that we've grooved into our brain. No more of those mental ruts that steer us away from God into whatever... Paul put it this way. Instead of a natural body, we'll rise with a spiritual body. Instead of a body and a brain running on the instincts of this world, we'll have a body and a brain in tune with the Spirit of God. Our every thought, our every word and action, our whole being, will reflect and show off the greatness and grace and glory of our God. And what a beautiful, glorious life that will be. All of that can be hard to imagine. Thoughts can go chasing this way and that way. What will it be like wondering this and wondering that? Paul helps me keep it all together. What will our bodies be like when we are in heaven? Paul gives this idea to us. Our bodies here in this world, our bodies die like seeds. That season of the year, perhaps, huh? I have here, Kay tells me, it's a nasturtium seed. It looks like a dry, shriveled up miniature brain. I don't see anything in it that looks good. She also gave me a couple lily balls. Paul would have us thinking that our bodies here in this world are like this. And get put into the ground or die shriveled up and die. But our bodies in heaven, when Jesus raises us to life, compared to these shriveled up pieces of death, our bodies in heaven will be like the flowers blooming. Blooming with life, blooming with color, blooming with glory. It's amazing, isn't it? Instead of ashes to ashes and dust to dust, that's not very hopeful. What do we get to look forward to? A change as great, as wonderful as going from something like this to something like that. We have better to live for than ashes and ashes and dust to dust. We have better to hope for. We get to hope for a life filled with the beauty and the glory and the amazing love of our God. And you, body and soul together, will show it and reflect it forever. What do we say to that? I don't know what you say, but I know what I say. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.